Well, welcome to another installment of Rugby of Reineke. Got two distinguished guests today. Um, one man, I don't really have to introduce him, the whole country knows him very well. World Cup winning captain, phenomenal human being, John Smith. Welcome. Thank you, it's us. It's been a busy couple of days. Yep. Um, you just came back from England, you want to run us through that today? Uh, I didn't think that I'd be wearing K-tape. Uh, after retiring from rugby, but yeah, England was good with the legends. 12-10 champagne rugby win in Gloucester in the mud and the rain. Um, but uh, I must say it was a, another sweet reminder that my days of rugby are, are long gone. <laughs> and it's competitive. <laughs> it is. Oh, I couldn't believe these guys came at us. Um, I thought it'd be a little stroll in the park, 60 minutes of sort of reminiscing. But no, it was full on, bro. I got cleaned. I tried to steal a ball. That was a mistake. Got cleaned. Did my hammy there. Came around the back of a line. I thought I was going to be under the poles with a drop kick to follow. Got smashed back by Nicky Little. So yeah, I've been put in my place. That's why I realised as well that the classics. You don't really. The injuries don't happen when uh, when you're carrying the ball or tackling. It's when you're trying to steal that ball. So that's where guys like Pocock. So you have to, Richie McCoy, you have to have, take your hat off for him because their bodies go for Richie, so much. Richie, how Richie lost, I mean, he's got the most caps of any guy and even, you know, every single team talk would have been like, you know, target Smashing. Richie, get him out of the way. How their bodies held up is incredible. It's a miracle. Yeah. And to his right, <coughs> probably the opposite of, of, you know, John, John Smith was a golden boy from a young age, basically bred to captain South Africa. On his right, the opposite of, of of it, a man that, you know, perseverance got him into rugby. There was something that he spoke to Brendan and Adams about last year, you know, staying in the system. I actually, I don't want to say it. I think you must tell us your, your rugby career. So Anton von Sale played to Stanford Sales, played for the Lions. I have to mention, man of a match against the Springboks for the Barbarians. Very important, Wilma. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Etas. Thanks for having me. That might have been the only game that I ever stole a ball in in my in my brief career. Well, you um, decimated the lineouts. I think I think I learned my lesson. Um, no, thanks for having me. Here. It's great to be here. Um, you, know, you mentioned staying in the system. I mean, I, I started much later than I think the majority of rugby players. I I'd like to think I focused on my studies, but that was just the way life went. Um, and yeah, you know, so after school, I left for Stellenbosch and, and first played a lot of cricket before a rib injury. Plaskin Academy, just not, don't, not, don't, not, not, don't not, be humble, don't not, be humble. Not Plaskin Academy, Boilant Academy. Boilant Academy. Yeah, um, and yeah, before a rib injury saw me leave the cricket season <coughs> early and so I showed up at, at rugby training, pre-season training early that year or rugby pre-season training for the first time in my life and things sort of gently took it, took it on from there but that, that was when I was, what, 21 um, and signed my first contract at 26, eh? so it was it was a long roundabout way, but yeah, what a, what an adventure. Yeah, you had a couple of successful years with Alliance, played for a long time in France for Stade Francais. Um, you know, I actually want to hear it out of your own mouth, but that's the reason why we need to invest in club rugby and keep growing our, our, you know, our foundations. A guy like yourself, I mean, you'll admit you were a bit raw when you came in. Let's say 2006, that carry cup. But you made that leap within a couple of months and you grew exponentially. Um, and I think that's that's why we should have our systems in place. Yeah, definitely. I, I'd like to think that, um, you know, that there's still hope for the guys who maybe... I think when I arrived at Varsity, I weighed... I was about 1.9 metres and I think I weighed 85 kilograms. So I wouldn't have fitted in into any modern day, or let alone even then, if there were provincial academies around, I wouldn't have fitted in maybe as a left wing or something. Yeah, but then they would have quickly been found out with my lack of pace. So... I, I mean, I, I know there are st various structures around at the moment. I think Garth April's a, a great story of a guy who came from just playing club rugby at Durbanville to next thing into the Sharks squad, and before he knew it, he was in the Springbok squad. You know, he's one that people would say maybe slipped through the net a bit. But I think I agree with you. I think it's incredibly important to have that, to have that um, accessibility for for players who, who don't get picked up straight away out of school. Because you're 100% right, you do pick up a lot of additional skills that, that you can apply to rugby if you, if you first work for a while, if you first, um, if you first study. Uh, you know, there's guys, a guy who comes to mind is Moritz Boerter. I think, didn't he lay carpets and you know, be a part-time? Yeah, just duplicy mm, as well. 100%. And, and, and the, all those skills would have made them, would be partially the reason why, why they became the rugby players that they are. Yeah, I want to I touch on it because we had the same conversation with Brendan and Adams and then 
we're talking about the Springbok team with Tour, and although they had many caps, they were young guys, inexperienced in terms of they've only experienced rugby, said one team, got drafted into a Springbok team they haven't, experienced other brands of rugby, other sides of life. I mean, John, you would know as yourself, mm. as a tight head, you only start maturing at 27, 28, and that's where you start giving punishment back. Um, you know, I, I also I kept also asking sort of you know myself even when I was with the Sharks as an administrator for the last three years. You know what sort of because you always look back and you don't want to be that guy that says it, you know in Maydale, you know. And um, but you guys are referencing to the, right now with club rugby and basically what you're talking about is an internship. You know, people get their sort of their sort of wings, yeah, you know, by by doing an internship, by by doing the hard yards and. Um, and I think, I suppose there's, the club rugby provides it, because you go and play club, and I played for Marysburg Varsity, and then you go and play some of these clubs, the guys in Petroleum are going to play police and get sort of smacked around for, for 80 minutes, and, but that makes them tougher. They learn how to you know, get around that. They learn how to move the ball a little bit faster and get around it. And if it's a team that's a student team, they learn how to tighten it up. And it's an internship, really. And I think you know, the sort of penny dropped, I watched this clip on YouTube from a guy called Simon Sinek about the millennials and uh, sort of this new generation that's got instant access, you know, the phone delivers everything, you know, you want a parcel, it arrives the next day and and um, I think somewhere along the line with club rugby sort of becoming, you know, less important and and now all we've really got for these guys is, is a varsity cup scenario but there's just been a sort of a, a missing element of an internship. There's nowhere really to toughen up as a tight forward. Where do you go? Oh, yeah. Who's going to teach you a few lessons? Who's going to buckle you in a scrum? And, and so I guess it's, it's a I guess we're in in between eras, you know, where this this group of guys, as you say, got a lot of caps. But um, what have they actually done? Where have they sort of really, you know, got the experience from? You know what I mean? Definitely, and a great story, and you would appreciate this, uh, Wilma. You know, uh, Van Roy and the the loose tight head for the Lions. He was playing club rugby for Pretoria Police, yeah. and one of the coaches, the JP Ferrara, the defence coach, that uh, went to the Springboks. He's pastor at his church begged him and said, please, just come watch them play. I think this guy could perhaps make it. Kept begging him for about three months. And one evening, he called again and JB found Akers and said, let's just go. Let's go watch him play. And it was a Wednesday evening. He was at the Lions training the next day already. By the following week, he's already signed a contract. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely, there's still space. And I, think I, got, I always think of a Gold Cup now. The Gold Cup is doing phenomenal. Yeah. Um, we spoke about it with Brendan as well. They played in Bulland and they had 6,000 guys at the, <coughs> you know, at the game. Um, so it, it's important yeah, we still grow that it, I think it's two ways, because I think, I mean, maybe there aren't as many structures there as what there used to be, but there, it's also a mindset thing that uh, somebody referred to now, and that in the, the, the players need to believe, they need to be able to stick it out, because that's where you really learn your internship, is when you play under lights, where the lights aren't proper, you know, aren't decent enough on a Wednesday night. You know, I could think of hundreds of games playing for Pirates in Joburg initially. You know what I mean? So it's... It did, yeah, ex guys need to sort of be able to hang in there and know that, listen, I might not be the most talented oak, but if I hang in there long enough, my chance is bound to come. Do a shock still, I remember when uh, Jake was coaching there and you were still involved, if you weren't playing for the Sharks, you guys made a concerted effort to get a guys to go play. Uh, you assigned them to clubs. Do they still do it at the yeah, Sharks? Yeah, well, it's obviously been a big thing because for us, we need our club rugby to be as strong as possible. We don't have a university. So yeah. it's a, sort of a, 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 you know, really it's a, a sort of a, a, a ray of light for us. It's really the only area that you can keep players alive and keep them interested. So our club rugby system is quite strong in Durban. And I think around the country, our, our school system is quite strong. We've got, we're still producing amazing yeah. schoolboys, you know. So um, it is important. Uh, and I think Varsity Cup has helped a, a huge amount. We, we sort of have tried to put some time into getting a, a one of our Varsities uh, into the Varsity Cup. But it's competitive. And um, I think everyone everyone's trying to do the same thing. So club rugby has to remain strong in Durban. Otherwise, we will just be a professional team that has to continue to you know fetch players from outside of the province. Talk about a Varsity Cup. <clears throat> do you think there's been this private sponsorship, you know, F&B, Steinhoff, can SA Rugby take a leaf out of that book and perhaps apply it to away stuff, you know, management runs things at SA Rugby? 
when you talk about administration, I think most administrations are really dependent on the people that are currently there and also by the constitution. And I guess you know it's very difficult to get anything done or changed from an SRB point of view because it's a dem democratic vote and you've got 14 unions that vote on where the game goes. And so of those 14 unions, only five really are f sort of franchise status. So um, there's always a sort of a lopsided feel as to what the, the best direction for South African rugby is. Whereas at Varsity Cup, everyone's in the same playing field. The rules are the same. You get your, you've got to qualify as a student. You've got to get the certain points to be able to play the next year. And, and uh, everyone works off the same sheet. Everyone's got the same purpose. And I, I guess that's where SA Rugby will have a, a difficulty in terms of trying to adopt anything that's coming from a you know, system that is working. I think you're the best guy to explain this. Um the change that came in with a 74% private holding uh, of a commercial arm. Perhaps give us a better insight into that and, and how it can change things. Well, I mean, it is a good sign. I think from going from a maximum of 49% equity to, to 74, I'm not sure what the criteria are and whether or not that 74% gives the equity partner the full rights to outvote any decision um, uh, in, in, a, in a boardroom. That for me is critical. If it's a 74% of equity ownership and, and risk rather than just the ability to make decisions, I think we won't really attract too many sponsors. But I don't know the ins and outs. You know, I wasn't involved in those uh, board, board meetings, but it is a step in the right direction. I think it gives... Um, businessmen the opportunity to to take control of, of teams that that have that have not been operating in a business sense very effectively for the last decade I guess uh, we look at the best league in the world the most expensive league in the world and it's top 14 owned by very wealthy very successful businessmen some of them a bit eccentric some of them a bit crazy but these guys it's their money they do what they want yeah. and they've created the most valuable rugby product in the world well, man, you play there I mean yeah, I think it's that's exactly how it is. You know, I think we we probably have a few structures that could teach some of those club owners, you know, how to how to maybe do things slightly better. But they do have the most powerful league, and it is the most and it is the wealthiest league. And and the fact is is that it's a league that a lot of players around the world just want to be a part of because you come up against some of the best players in the world. The real loser there, though, is the French rugby union, mm, yeah. because it's completely privately owned. Is that that is is the French union and the French team play second fiddle almost constantly? They've also now had a few um, small victories, giving the guys yeah. a bit more t time in camp. Um, I think quite similar to what came out of the recent block in Darba, but I mean it's really been such an uphill battle. It's their their team is so old school. You know, the guys still find out in the newspaper whether they're in the squad or yeah, not. I novice. Yes, yeah. I mean. It's proper. It's proper old school, which is which is why they fluctuate as they do, you know. But um, but 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 100 percent. There's got to be a decent balance. Um, we've got to find a way to get to get private guys in, helping make good business decisions. Rugby needs to be sustainable. But uh, that's actually perhaps my question. So they're leaving that space because we're talking about a majority vote now. So they're leaving 26 percent now, still in the hands of a union. Is that kind of still leaving a bit of power for the union? You see, again, we can't we also can't be hypocritical because we talk on the one hand of keeping club rugby alive yeah, and that it's strong for internships <laughs> and, and guys to sort of learn the ropes. Um, and so we can't discard the the, sort of the 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 basic sort of grassroots level of where the games come from. And uh, and I mean, it certainly, it doesn't mean that that every amateur union is 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 created the downfall of rugby in this country. It just means that decisions taken over the last 10, 20 years, you know, have, have put us in this point. And I think in the past, I guess, a lot of that sort of can be sort of uh, hidden by good, really good Springbok teams that are winning trophies and, and beating the All Blacks, hopefully, you know, constantly once a year. Um, and when that doesn't happen, then all of a sudden their focus goes into what have you been doing for the last 10 or 15 years. Yeah. You know? So um, I think it's important that we have a very strong amateur uh, uh, I guess side to rugby in this country, so that the the, the schools aren't forgotten because that is the, the, the sort of that's the pipeline, pipeline yeah, of, yeah. of talent. And club rugby, as much as it's changed, you know the Gold Cup has been fantastic. And for us in Durban, it's it's a lifeline. You know, so um, 
we've got to get the balance right and make sure that you know the, the, that there's people who have rugby's in, uh, uh, interests at heart and uh, I guess that that aren't there for themselves that are just making decisions to benefit the game in totality and it was quite refreshing going in New Zealand for the test uh, last year in in, in Canterbury um, although the Saturday was quite difficult but you know I was invited to a couple of their functions and to see how they operate and and, and to meet some of the administrators some of whom had played for the All Blacks not all of them but um, really the, the the only focus, the only focal point was what were the All Blacks doing? You know, they were all from different franchises, Chiefs, from uh, from the Crusaders, from all over. I don't think they spoke about their, their, their home affiliation once in the whole week that I was there. And I think that's really where we, we, mm. we might be missing the boat. <coughs> I know at the Sharks, you said the president of the Sharks, he pays his own way if he goes with a team. On a weekend, the Stormers played, uh, played in, in Zimbabwe, and I, I got the team Tuesday evening on the airport. And is this also, I saw Thelo Wakefield there. He traveled with him, they had a team building. Now, I, I don't really know what value he can add going on a trip mm. as a team building trip. You know, it's the same, he travels overseas when they play in Austra Australasia. Is there still space for that in South Africa? No. Look, I guess that's where the sort of like grey area comes in between this, because amateur owns professional rugby, you know. So in, in the reality of it is Thelo is the boss of the entire rugby system in 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 the western cape um for us it was it was it just worked differently we you know we had a president that had certain skills that he would administer from from a distance and in the boardroom um Thelo obviously must have some some different skills in the change room that we don't know about yeah we're, my, <coughs> we're talking corporate now as well and, and i thought of you you two guys are perfect guys to talk about it that transition from sport into real life into the corporate world and I talk us a bit through it because it's it's difficult. I don't think people realise the difference from being a professional rugby player into going into corporate life. Mm. A lot of guys are not adequate enough to get into it. You know, talk us through it a bit. I mean, you you guy yourself quite successful in the corporate world. Um, you'll have a good grasp. Yeah, I think I think it is a it is an uncomfortable transition because it's because a professional professional rugby is sort of. It's a, it's a very committed way of life in, in that for pr pretty much 48 weekends of the year, give or take, your Monday to Saturday is pretty much planned for you because the team needs to be together, your trainings are planned, your matches are planned, you know your travel schedule. Suddenly when you step away from that, there's a lot more reliance on, on, on you as a person to, you know, depending on what direction you're going, but to, to meet your KPIs. And, and that then takes a further spin where one thing I miss about rugby a lot is you arrive on a Monday and you prepare for the game on a Saturday. You know, it's all, it builds up slowly and then it's, then it's the game. And you know, the minute that final whistle is gone, you know whether you've succeeded or whether mm, you mm. failed. Your KPI is immediately It's there. done. You can look clearly. There's a score. You won or you lost. And you move on. On the Monday, you start afresh and you've got a chance to do it again. Corporate world's very different, you know. Companies, the company that you're part of, depending on what type, is probably measured, you know, at... at at the most regularly, you might be measured quarterly, but that's that doesn't really happen. You know, sometimes it, it can take years to bring in a new, you know, to 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 implement a vision, to to launch a new product, and then you never really get that sort of clear-cut measurement. So that's something that that personally for me was was quite a difficult adjustment to sort of be able to see past that clear. Okay, we're up or we're down, and it's time to move on. You know, you've got to sort of bring in other ways of, of measuring yourself and, and, and setting objectives and meeting objectives. Um, and it is tough. I was lucky that I had something, you know, waiting for me to, to go straight into. But I think for other guys who haven't thought that far ahead, it, 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 it compounds itself because, you know, as, you, as, you, as we become more mature, our, our responsibilities grow in terms of family and there's other people who, who depend on you. And I guess that's another reason why I'm grateful that my career did start a bit late because it, it forced me, or, 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 or yeah, it forced me to, yeah. to make sure that I had something to fall back on because rugby was very far from a from a dead cert, you know, for a very long time. I mean, you got you got thrown into the deep end immediately, mm. John. I, mean, I don't think anybody could <laughs> describe that. I, was, I, I had a, I had what I thought was a cushy two years in Toulon, swapped for a, a three years stint at CA. Look, I, it's amazing listening to Worms because. I can tell you right now, the thing that I struggled with the most in the first six months to a year was 
you're either, in running, you're either winning or losing. And you yeah. know that if you've lost, it's because you've lost the game and you're on Sunday, you can start fixing it already. You can mm -hmm. go through some videos, you can work on it. And so creating a plan always worked on a sort of five day process for us. You know, So we would start planning on Sunday, we implement on Monday, by Friday it's all done. Saturday, you know if you're right or you're wrong and then you start that process again. And I just found that with, within our business, you know, I just, I didn't ever, you know, I felt like in the first six months, I, so eventually I just started creating longer plans and getting patient about, about checking on, on how we were going. So now you've got to sort of check on yourself and see where you're going and, and there's, there's no actual result to do it. So for me, that was a massive frustration. I mean, for rugby players in general, you know, life is pretty simple like, and yeah. so you get spoon fed for the majority of your, of your career. So, um, I, I was, I guess, lucky or, or, or uh, keen to try things and I started little businesses from the age of 23 some of them were colossal failure but they all it was, the, the <laughs> yeah, good ones and the bad ones all taught yeah. me valuable lessons and I surrounded myself with normal people as well so I understood their their pressures and their stresses as well whereas you become you become insular if you stay within a, a rugby environment the whole time and it literally becomes a fairy tale and when you get out into the real world it's terrifying you know so uh, a small thing for me I stopped training for two months after I started the job it's just flat out and didn't think about it and thought geez I've been paid to train for yeah. 15 years and eventually started affecting who I was because there's a little monster inside of us that we activate at training whether it's worms and I and a little one-on-one -on -one or whether it's and that monster sort of doesn't go away you got to keep sort of yes. feeding it you know and that and dynamic is also different 100% because now there's no <coughs> like you say in rugby you always get found out in rugby at some stage now you have to manage a relationship differently because you you know that guy is not going to get exposed like in rugby, and that mm. dynamic must have been difficult for you. Yeah, absolutely, and you've got to go, uh, go about it in a much softer way. Rugby is quite easy, you know. If you and I go one on one, and we're both competing for the number two shirt, and at training we can st show the coach, but you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a different situation where it's sort of a, an environment that's got ladies and there's some older mm. people than, than you, you know, you've got to manage things in a far sort of broader, softer, softer version. And those skills, you don't just, you know, you got to learn those skills along the exactly. way. You bump your head. I mean, look at my mates at my age they're all eight years into the corporate world they're all sort of sitting where they want to sit and they've worked hard to get there you know mm -hmm. so as a rugby player you come out 34 35 if you're lucky quite greed and um you know your version of traveling overseas was putting your suitcase outside of the five-star <laughs> hotel and then picking it up in your five-star hotel in london you know so these kind of things they don't, they don't sort of they don't make they make life easier when you're a rugby player but they don't teach you about what's coming yeah. um tell me quickly if i had to give you a chance to talk about your time as a ceo you know I think a lot of people had a misperception that you weren't the director of rugby, you were the CEO. Mm. So it's not that you, you ran the team yourself. I mean, talk to us just about your time as a CEO. Yeah, Flip, I think um, what, probably the three most three most amazing years. I mean, I, I, I really I enjoyed the journey. It was, it was blooming tough. I mean, the first six months, I literally spent my time asking questions and, and really getting to understand the business of rugby. You know, you sit at the back of the bus as a senior player and you sort of got all the answers and you know how everything's supposed to work and if only they just did X, yeah. Y and Z, yeah. we would be the greatest union in the world, you know. Um, and, but it's a tough job, especially when you, 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 you're operating within a system that, that has its limitations as well. So for me, finding out from a business point of view, learning all these lessons as well in the, in the that first year and and being able to try and implement change and thankfully I had a board that was quite supportive of, 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 of me as well so um, an incredible journey for me uh, to have to have done it I think I think the, the timing I suppose the misconception of what I did uh, uh, from a rugby point of view was it's it's easy to understand I mean people associate me with rugby and what happens on the field you know so and as a CEO you also are responsible for what it ends up on the field but the challenge as well is also to be a CEO that's played rugby for 15 years that doesn't interfere with the sort of a coach and a team and sort of you know gives advice and tries yeah. to guide and so um, that misconception I think is just easy because of what I did for so long uh, people only ever saw me as a rugby player you know so um, yeah I guess it's just it's it's one of the things that uh, uh, I had to also learn to be able to know what my job was and, and stick to that but uh, it was hard to resign and I think that and and it's just something that gave me a, a huge kick. I mean, the, 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 the setting up of a plan of now getting used to not being rewarded every week or knowing every week, but actually working towards a five-year plan was, was something that I enjoyed working towards. But uh, it did come at a sacrifice. And, and, and probably the timing of getting this job was at the wrong time of me and my family and my kids. They're just too young. Uh, and and I was just I was missing the boat. So as much as I was diving 100% for the sharks and working really really hard, you know I was I was getting it wrong back home. And, and it was I don't think you can be half baked on both sides. Yeah. You know, so a, a decision had to be made. So I flip, 
I love the three years. We'd love to have done, done, done longer. But, you know, I went on a two-week uh, trip overseas now. I, and I truly believe, it's quite sad, but I truly believe it's the first trip that my kids have actually ever cried while I've been away. You know, and it's, it sounds funny, but it's actually quite sad because they were just used to me being away the whole yeah. time. Yeah. I think probably probably a challenge. Sorry, it does, but around being CEO of a, of a rugby union, particularly in this country, is that you're almost measured on 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 two fronts because mm. you need to win the trophies, which is maybe not your direct actual day to day job. But then you also got to look after your bottom line on the financial statements because yeah. that's what the directors want to see in terms of sustainability and being able to attract the players that you want to be able to bring young players in if you need to expand your infrastructure, you know, to make your academy better, you need to be a sustainable business model. But then in the same thing, that's not what, you know, the people are measuring the sharks on. Yeah. Well, you know, the bottom line is, in this country, if you won Super Rugby and Curry Cup and you made a million rand loss, you'd be deemed CEO of the year. Yeah. Yeah. If you didn't make a semi-final of a Super Rugby and came into a, semi in a, in a semi-final of a Curry Cup and made a hundred million, no one would give a rat's ass, no. and 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 so and that's the reality. We're yeah. a rugby passionate uh, nation. Uh, I mean, I, I've had discussions with stakeholders that are that are that, that whom we need to come to the stadium, and they've got no interest in the financial status of the, of the business. So when you cut six springbucks from your bottom line because you've got to you've got to make a budget that works, yeah. and then you've got to sort of <coughs> sneak into a quarter final on the New Zealand leg, you know that for you is a, is an absolute victory, but everyone else sees yeah. it as a complete failure. You know what I mean? No, no, and in fact, I mean, you, like you said, you cut a lot of spring boxing, but you had actually had a great season that year. Well, it's not a great season, but yeah. with a, a team with an average age of 22, 23, 100%. six spring bucks off, sort of, off, the, off the, um, the contract list, you know, and then playing against all the New Zealand teams and getting through to a quarterfinal, you sort of think if you'd, if you'd put those criteria to any coach or CEO in the beginning of the season, they all would have signed on the dotted line. No, sure but right. fans want only one thing, and that's trophies, and, and I don't think we must change that. How far removed is being a CEO from a normal corporate to being a CEO from a, from in terms of a rugby union? Because I'm thinking now, now where are we going to breed guys, you know, to, to make it more successful? How, how far is it removed, Wilma? Not a hundred. Do we need ex-players? Do we need more business guys to come in as CEOs? What what's going to be? I think the I think that, I don't know if you have to be an ex-player, but I think being a professional rugby player will definitely help you. It'll definitely help you understand. That, the dynamics, especially in this country. I mean, I can't speak too much about the Sharks, but obviously Western Province is the well-known political aspect because we've got so many amateur clubs who all have the same vote. You've got to be able to understand that that dynamic, yeah. that, that dynamic. but then some business acumen is, is absolutely crucial, whether it's as an entrepreneur, you know, starting your own business. I mean, you, you probably learned more from the businesses that didn't go so well than from those that did. Sure, I'm I learning a imagine. lot. <laughs> Uh, but you know, no, I think it's the balance, though. It's like, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm an ex-player who's been in CEO, and, and I, I truly believe that we need more businessmen, more businessmen, more commercial yeah. businessmen involved. So whether it's the, the businessman as CEO and maybe an ex-player that sits on a board, but to to marry the two to be, create a balanced decision-making process. Oh, but uh, I mean, it's certainly not a game that needs to be managed by ex-players only. No, 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 no. There I mean, needs to be an influence as to sort of what the ethos of the team was yeah, and, and, and what it really means inside of a change room because businessmen don't understand that. But yeah. businessmen make have made those decisions. They've s sort of done their internship and, and they've been CEOs of four or five different companies and yeah. having that balance, I think, is what really is key for us. Well, you both played in, in a Northern Hemisphere. I wanna, <coughs> and I, I should remember you saying once, I think you agreed with, with Oregon Hoskins that said Africa should perhaps look at playing Northern Hemisphere teams you know, instead of playing in the Super Rugby. What's your feeling still on that? Do you yeah, think I, it's I've a model I, that could work? I've had this opinion for a long time, even when I played. I think us um, commuting to Australia and New Zealand for the last how many years is... It, it, in the beginning, it was fantastic. We needed it. We'd come out of sort of isolation and we needed this exposure. And at the, ti you know, at the time, these were the best teams to play. Um, you know, right now, I mean, it's, 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 it takes its toll. It's still much harder for a South African team to compete in Super Rugby. It's just you're further away, you, f you spend more time away. And, um, and you know, we, we, we've got this ally that sits in the same timeline. That's an 11-hour flight overnight. You can sleep. You don't have to worry about sleeping tablets. Mm. And you can literally play an away game in Leicester and leave on the Sunday night and arrive on the Monday and train Tuesday and have a normal week. So, um, and allied to the fact that there is... 
a ton load more money from a broadcasting point of view in the Northern Hemisphere, whether it's the, with the French or whether it's with the Premiership or with the, the Irish teams, which are unbelievably competitive. Mm -hmm. So there is this unbelievable opportunity to go north. Um, it means that we would play New Zealand less, and then New Zealand would end up having to only play Argentina and Australia. And I can tell you right now, New Zealand would not like that option because I think we're the team that's kept them at the top of world rugby because they've always managed to play against us. Mm -hmm. They've travelled and it's hard to play in South Africa. And so it's um it's a it's a long long debate. Uh, but yeah, you know, my 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 opinion of the matter is that you know our our our, our need would be to go north. These teams are competitive. You know, we 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 got to say the New Zealanders have been the best team for a long time. But I'm not so sure how far away England are, mm -hmm. uh, having given the opportunity to play them at the moment. And I've been there. The, the coaching structures That's in the UK are unbelievable. Well, yeah. The best coaches in the world are in the, in France and the UK. It's, it's mm -hmm. a fact. Whether they, whether they all New Zealanders is is is, is, is another point. Mm -hmm. But all the best coaches are there, and so it's not like we would be downgrading the quality of people we're playing. Because we, we spoke about it as well. If something that's started to happen in the last decade, they started to get their, their academies in place. Mm. Ireland, I mean, I played out, I saw it with my own eyes. We see it at, at Saracens. Yeah. All these boys that's playing for England, Sky said, was at, uh, at Saracens Academy. And I mean, that five, six years exposure to training with seniors without mm. them having, having to play. The question we've got to ask ourselves is if we went over and we played a Super 12 between four South Africans, four English, and four French, our best team last year, the Lions, by a long way. How would you think they would fare against Saracens right now? Well, we've seen, <coughs> I'm thinking back of it, Saracens when they played the Stormers, which was, in a sense, they didn't go, it was in winter, but because of our artificial pitch, they didn't have to, they did not have to adapt their mm. game, which, and they did pretty well in the end. Yeah. And I've seen the Sharks played them as well. Mm. But if they have to go play that same game at Leicester on a muddy pitch, you know, that's where I think, I don't know, could, could we adapt? That's, that's good. That's what I think. I well, we've, we've certainly got to learn at an international stage. You yeah, know. 100%. I, I've, I mean, I stand corrected, but super rugby in terms, of, in terms of a sustainable commercial model and in popularity and viewership is struggling a little bit. A lot, you yeah. know, the, the peaks of Super 12 and Super 14 when stadiums were sold out and, thing, and attracting all this unbelievable international viewership, I think, I understand is drying up. And we need a new product and it'll be, it'll be such a refreshing... Um, new dynamic and I think it would benefit the whole of South African rugby as well Could it, but it's as John said now I can't see Australia and New Zealand liking that to any extent and they'll do absolutely everything to prevent that happening precisely because the value of of what's left will will be diminished uh, dramatically and overall for our rugby do you think it'll be good for I think rugby absolutely. development I think 100% would be good I mean I think if there's one thing that impressed me about my time in France, maybe not so much at my club, but just in, in being more involved in the European competitions, is, is the way that the European teams manage their squads. You know, they play in England, you guys sometimes play four competitions, you know, mm -hmm. at, at the same time. Yeah. And, 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 and that ability to leverage off, off your depth, you know, I think in Super Rugby, it's definitely improving, but South Africans, we've still got the mentality we can play our best 15. For week in week, you know what I mean, and that's yeah. just at the, at the, <coughs> with the levels of intensity and physicality. I just, again, it's just not, it's no good for player welfare. See, I, I've been noted again now. So many French guys are 35, 36, signing, like base, signing, like signing, signing contract extension. And I know what people think it is maybe a bit slower and all that, but a, a large amount of it is because they don't play that many games. Training is managed. Softer um, fields. You know, and that comes from confident, confident coaches have the ability to have faith in a squad and rotate. Yeah. Yeah, and um, this country does not give confidence to coaches. You know, you're either winning or you're being fired. Yeah. So, yeah. so, I mean, it's sort of the chicken and the egg. So where, what do you plug, which hole do you plug first? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a long conversation that as well. Yeah, that's a, we could talk about it a whole day. Mm. What's going on at Stade Francais? <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that. I had a chat to uh, quite good friends with the, with the trainer there. No, look, there have been a few... Okay. Um, the, the, the president, when he took over, he comes from a very wealthy French family, the Savars. And he made it his mission when he took over, which was 2011. He said he wants to breed the next group of French players. He's over with Stade Francais being this international cosmopolitan team. He's investing in the youth and he wants local French players, preferably Parisians, to come through the system and to make the French team. He stuck to it and he actually did so well. 
when was it two years ago i think we had five local parisian boys starting for the French national it. team no no, no uh, yes during that year yes 100 percent now what's happened is because these guys values have grown significantly they're all attracting a lot of attention from toulon clermont and racing uh, to lose yeah racing's not involved in those five but so, so what's happened is four of them have signed to leave because the president said he he doesn't he doesn't trade horses he believes these oaks should be loyal and he's not prepared to match the ridiculous money that's being thrown at them other guys have turned around and said you know but now you wanted us to be invested in this journey we've done that now you're letting all these oaks go so a few other french guys have left on top of that gonzalo casada had given his assurance to the team he'd been he, he's been fantastic for the team since joining in two, uh, 2013 um given his assurance he'd stay on for another year he then walked out the door um and now greg cooper who's only been there for three three months or something has been given a three-year contract as the head coach uh, so there's the turmoil there is incredible, but I mean that that is you know Stade Francais it's a it's a phenomenal club with a decorated history, but it's it's the the emotional volatility of the French oh. is evident nowhere <laughs> more particular than at than at Stade Francais you know two years ago top fourteen champions again this year not, relegation yeah again this year not going to make the top six. Um, yeah, I get frustrated for the guys. I've still got a lot of mates there. And we've got some South Africans who, who are doing so well there. Mornay was critical in, 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 in winning that. Well, I'm winning almost that. well again. Absolutely. Um, Gerard Mostert, still hitting racks. He's, okay. a, he's a beast, that guy. No arms whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> but, I think they gave Vanke van Amado another eight-year contract yeah, or something. Also, he, <laughs> doesn't, he doesn't say a word. He just scrums. Just scrums. And I mean, cleans. that's the best thing for the Frenchies. So yeah, it's sad, but I mean, it's also it's 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 what makes the French game yeah. exactly what it is. It's for me, it was a big draw card there. You know, they they don't the the French crowds don't want to see four try bonus points. They want to see four fights, three red cards, yeah. two yellow cards, 40 scrums. Yeah, and the home team must kick the winning penalty in the last minute. They want drama, they want real scandal. You know, and afterwards, they if if, if you score a, a you know. A bonus point and four tries to null. You know your defense is outstanding there, but like, oh, Sheepers' opposition was so weak. Eh? But you know, no, no matter how well you're playing, it, it doesn't matter. They love the drama. They love the suspense, um, and, and and that's probably why they also still, in certain in certain instances, like I mentioned, their their national team, why they are a bit they old school still. In the amateur because yeah, but yeah. but they love it. They, they love that thing of, you know, Frenchies if they can lose 40-0 one game that next game they are so on fire and they will they will kill i mean that's that's and that's why they come back and produce performances that will go down as some of the greatest games in the world it's funny i actually love like talking about i want to want to talk about toulon you know the correlation between toulon and the bulls <clears throat> the point i want to make is i'll will never forget remember how dominant clement was up to 2013. it was basically a, a, a set thing they were going to be heineken champions finally Played too long in the final. They never should have lost. They dominated it. They completely dominated it. it and somehow, somehow, Toulon, two bounces of a ball, went their way. They won a game. Now, for me, that was exactly the same. That's what happened in 2007 between the Sharks and the Bulls. Sharks completely dominated a game. Somehow, Lord only, only knows how, they won a game. Vickers had and completely... Completely stole that ball illegally. If you go watch that game again, he was on his knees digging the ball out. In front of Lyndon Bray. In front, yeah. And Look, I'm just there, glad you brought that up because this conversation <laughs> is going so well. Eh? But so the point I want to make is, Jeez. and the Bulls from not, shouldn't have won a game, kicked on into a, a, a dynasty. Yeah. And exactly the happen, same happened to Toulon. They transformed that into a three-year dynasty. Three-year domination, Clemots. yeah. So what, what, is, what psychological thing is it that the most dominant team don't win it and then from there it's as if they fall off a cliff and you know the, the other team just gets a boost on well, Claremont I played there and they had a lot of demons in terms of playoff games and they'd lost how many finals in the in the top four in the top 14 competition so it was when they won their first one I think Maurice Joubert was there and Brent Russell I think at the time yeah it was it was a big thing and that was like a, a tipping point but you talk about what, what it is, whether it's luck, you know, most trainers will tell you there's no such thing, you know, you work for these kinds of things. But a little break like that uh, with a team of, like the Bulls, and they had some really good young players that were going to kick on for the next three years. So the timing is good. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's a collection of, of different <coughs> factors. And you can have that little 
little bit of luck and your team's all 32, 33, 34 and, it, and it, you don't really get to kick on. So put them at 27, 28, 29. You're going to have a three golden years if you can keep that squad together because they're actually old enough to be mature and make good decisions. They become good decision makers. They've played for almost 10 years already. And there's this, this opportunity that, that sort of, that spark, that win, it just lifts everyone. So mm -hmm. you train, it, training's easier. It's more fun. You, your mates are much better guys than they were the year before <laughs> because you're surrounded by winning. You know what it's like. You lose five games on a own tour. Honestly, yeah. you don't want to come out of your room, but your, your best mate is, yeah. is the yeah. remote on the TV. So it's, it's works both ways. And so that, thing, that, that sort of spin-off of positivity and winning in a squad that's got good players that are all at sort of the right prime age, um, like Eddie Jones. Eddie Jones, is, I mean, he's done a great job, but he's got an unbelievable, amount of talented kids between 24 and 28 at the moment so all he's got to do is hang on because that team is going to continue to win for yeah, the next yeah. four to five years yeah. and there's two guys that you know have had the structures in place for a long time it's guys that came out of the same structures under the same coach as Steve Boffuk has gone with him um, mm. was, tell me quickly what what's the Sharks look like this year the squad for you what do you what do you think of a Super Rugby for them? Look, I think they're going to be better placed to 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 go a little bit further than Super Rugby. Also, we're on a on the Australian leg of things as well, so our travel's a little bit easier. Um, and we've got a team that's that that was bitterly disappointed by how they exited in a, in a quarter final. Um, and some exciting youngsters, and I think that's sort of really really where the theme of this team's gone is about what we can build with this group of players. Um, and phew, the youngsters that we've got have had a year's experience, those that have played in their first Super Rugby. Some of those guys have kicked on to an a end of year South African tour. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> I'm, I'm excited to see how they go. And the, and the Stormers women, how do you see, see them going this year? I think there's a lot of good energy there. I think, I mean, they, they, you know, there was a lot of turmoil last year with Eddie taking the England job at the last minute. I think Flecky did an outstanding job. Um, they used the Curry Cup to really leverage up on some on some very talented youngsters, the Duplessis cousins come to mind straight away, um, and there's some there's a what I like about them is they've got a core group of of very good Springboks, and then they're now also getting that that sort of middle hardened, you know, three, four, five the non Springboks that you need the non Springboks but who played there four or five Super Rugby seasons, which where I think is the biggest gap in terms of losing overseas players because you're always going to lose your your your, your top spring box they are going to be attracted by, by by some of the wealthiest clubs but you need you need those you need those um guys who've been who've built up 30 40 50 super rugby caps played six or seven carry caps you know done the internships you know and are, and are and, and are able to step into that senior role but that's what that's <coughs> where I feel we we've got a big void in South Africa because as soon as a non springboard guy gets yeah. to that level, well, it's just about to he say. goes earns his, he, he as gets a CEO, a that guy is impossible to contract because he gets his year, he's worth two pounds. to three times more anywhere exactly. else in the world, and that's where we're falling behind. And, and I think about how, how I grew up. I grew up with uh, Tashmans, you know, uh, Jamie Thompson, John Slade, Mark Andrews, you know, Oli Rue, Chris Rousseau. All mm -hmm. these guys were sort of finishing their careers, and that's who I sort of learned. I, those are the guys that I looked up towards, yeah. and, and and I learned from, but I mean, we got we got no old guys no. playing in South Africa, Absolutely. none. So our, our our experienced guys are the 25, 26 year olds, and and the 19, 20 year olds are learning from them. You know, so it's a very difficult thing to expect mm. our teams to be tough, because they haven't really got anyone to sort of mm. find out what it takes to be tough. You know, and and I mean, I had to literally carry bags for two years, and and uh, and I and I had to certainly know my place. But I was treated with respect, and I had to earn my respect. You know, mm -hmm. and so we lose this void. And that player is so critical. Those mm -hmm. soldiers, those guys, yeah, are, are so critical for a team. The backbone, really, because uh, you know when the sort of days are dark and you're on your line, and you know there's this couple of oaks. Who, Job with yeah, this. Yeah, That's yeah. the first guy that exactly. comes to mind. They've got a, a very very little respect for their own personal bodies and lives, mm -hmm. and and those guys are infectious. You know, and so a youngster will see. Sure, how's this guy? You know. If, yeah, he could be doing something else. I can think of the top of my head, Jock Bertus, on two occasions where he wasn't even in a squad for the day. You get an injury at warm up, he gets drafted in and he gets man of a match. Yeah. Two, two occasions, I actually remember that happening. Yeah, he's yeah. a champion. So tell me, John, just quickly, we're going to run out of time. Um, what do you keep yourself busy with these days? Um, I guess I've, uh, I've I've got a few of my own businesses which have been going on in the background. I think my, I, I, I th told my partners I'd be getting involved in that. Um, 
I don't think they were that happy. <laughs> um, but when I when I resigned, um, Gav Regis asked me to get involved for uh, an organisation called Rugby Centurions, which they've been working on for about two years. Uh, so all the all the guys and girls who've played 100 tests or more for the country, put them into an organisation called Rugby Centurions and uh, create a, a charitable group of alumni, I guess, that, that helped the game of rugby. And the amazing thing, travelling the world, meeting up with these people, was to see how keen people are to give back from a game that they got so much from. And there's such a disparity between rugby and, and football. And uh, if this group can somehow be an ambassador for the game, you know, help bridge the gap between football and soccer, make a difference, you know, the money that we can raise commercially, spend it in, in areas of the world where rugby is possibly not as big as it should be and, and build the game in areas that we, we know it should be big. You know, in Asia, it's, it's, it's a massive market. Um, then we'll do that in, in conjunction, obviously, with the approval of World Rugby. So they're excited about what we can do on the side, sort of as this, this group of alumni that, that want to give back to the game. And uh, hopefully we'll have our, our first... Um, Gala event in, in November, but it's, okay. it's, I guess, it's just an excuse to have another team to be a part of. 100%. Wimo, you just became a father. Yeah. Talk us through that quickly. Yeah, sure. Ten days ago, welcome little Michael Fonsell into the world. Half a meter mic. A half meter mic, yeah. Very excited, eh? very, very grateful. Um, mom and baby doing so well. I wish you guys had told me that it was going to be this good. I would have got involved a lot sooner. <laughs> um, wait, let's just give, <laughs> you, let's give you three months. But. Wait, wait till you get a second one, and your third one you have to start paying school fees. <laughs> that's, that's when it'll go. Right, gentlemen, I'm not going to keep you a lot longer. I know we have the Cape Town Tens on, you have to go make speeches. John, I want to thank you for coming. Um, as always, absolute gentleman. You've got so much to give back to the game as well. Um, there's so many things I actually still wanted to talk to you about, you know, development in the country, and I think we can speak mm. a lot about that. And, and we are. I think SRAP is going wrong in the development uh, strategy. We're almost same, you're a big corporate guy. Thanks a lot for your time. We really appreciate it. Shot.